Sali is the largest town on Dugi Otos, yet still only a small, comfortable village with a population of about 1,000. On the little arable land available, they grow a few grapes to make their wine, a few olives for their oil, and they keep a few animals for their own use, to make goat cheese or to put the occasional lamb on the supper table. Ships from the mainland regularly deliver not only essential drinking water, but also everything else the population might need, especially the tourists. There are not many places to stay on the island, but those that are available are used mainly by scuba divers. Sali is the gateway to exciting underwater excursions. The dives are either along the steep cliff faces, which continue underwater to depths of up to 90 meters, or into underwater caves, home to an enormous variety of sea creatures, from sea urchins and starfish to sponges and a rich selection of fish. The diving stations are well equipped and experienced diving instructors accompany their guests on the diving tours approved by the National Park Administration. First time divers are amazed at the underwater beauty of the Telashitsia Paradise. It might not be the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, but the local biodiversity is enormous. Starfish, mollusks, and colorful reef-building corals are in abundance. And even a large-scale scorpionfish is to be found here. Crabs hide in the many nooks and crannies, just as the European conger and the fork-bearded codfish do. Unfortunately, enjoying the creatures of the sea in their natural habitat remains the privilege of those who have the courage to stick their heads underwater. But others, particularly the ladies, can share the fascination with coral in other ways. Let's have a look around the town of Shibenik, the city of fortresses and towers. Shibenik was mentioned for the first time in the year 1066. Today, about 52,000 people live in this well-kept metropolis on the Kirka River. The 16th century town hall looks more like a restaurant than a government building, and its architecture stands as a reminder of the long-term presence of the Venetians. The most distinctive attraction in Shibenik is the Cathedral of St. Jacob. The builders of the three-naved basilica were obviously not in a hurry. Construction began in 1431. Four master builders worked on the church, one after another, until it was finally completed in the year 1535, 104 years later. The official dedication of the cathedral was also delayed. It didn't happen until about 20 years after the building was completed. Because of its exceptional vaulted ceilings, constructed with 80 self-supporting stone plates, UNESCO declared the House of God to be a World Cultural Heritage Site. Pope Leo XIII bestowed upon the church the title Small Basilica in 1895. That is a very special title. From that time forward, the papal crest has adorned the portals of the cathedral.
the cityscape of Shibenik is truly impressive. But we've come for another reason. The artistic handcrafts. And we find what we are looking for, nearly hidden and inconspicuous in a small workshop on the island of Slarin, only a few minutes away by boat. Coral jewelry. The tradition of polishing coral on this island is centuries old. But because redstone coral can only be found at great depths today and is under environmental protection, the painstaking handcraft is hardly worthwhile anymore. All that remains is a small museum where visitors are treated to a demonstration of the jewelry maker's artistry. The Bay of Shipanska Luka that Shibenik lies on is not only a beautiful natural harbor, it is also part of the estuary of the Kirka River. An estuary is a place where the mouth of a river is set awash with seawater at high tide. The 72 kilometer long river is one of the most spectacular in Europe. Its source can't be exactly determined. Many of the waterways feeding the Kirka run underground. The river's journey through the limestone of a high plateau down to the sea takes it through rapids, over terraces, into basins, and over waterfalls, or through stretches where the river broadens to the size of a lake. The waterfalls are the main attraction of the national park established along the Kirka River. Dozens of smaller and a handful of larger barriers line up in the riverbed. The water falls only a total of 46 meters through the entire length of the national park on its way to the sea. At some points, the Kirka is more than 100 meters wide. At others, the water rages with enormous force through narrow gorges. The many historical remains of settlements, castle ruins and small villages in and around the National Park, as well as former water-driven mills, testify to the fact that people have been utilizing the water power of the Kirka for centuries. The water mills, for example, supplied the surrounding towns with flour over the centuries. But the inhabitants have also appreciated the natural environment of this landscape. Protecting it in the form of a national park, however, is a relatively new idea. In 1948, a stretch of the river was declared an environmentally protected area. It was only in 1955 that the Kirka was elevated to the status of a national park. Today, the park is a refuge for insects, more than 860 types of plant, various reptiles, over 200 species of birds, and some predatory animals. The 12-kilometer-long lake Vizovatsko Yezero is actually not a lake, but rather a wide stretch of the Kirka River. The partially man-made island of Vizovac in the northern section of the lake has a surface of only 10,000 square meters. A Franciscan monastery was built on the island in 1445. Five years before, the threat of the invading Turkish hordes in 1440 became too much for the monks living there and they fled this area, known today as Dalmatia. Just five years later, Franciscans from Bosnia took over the island and built a monastery. Its library has writings in Old Croatian and handwritten manuscripts from as far back as the 15th century on display. Today, only a handful of monks live on the island. Just as their brothers in the faith in times past, they spend their days mostly in prayer and meditation and the care of the monastery garden.
we end our tour of the Kirka River Valley with a small detour to the unusual Torok Lake in the canyon of the Zikola tributary. The circular lake is fed by an underground spring rising from its center. Access to the water is strictly forbidden because it is one of the most important sources of water for the towns of Shibenik and Knin. At the small village of Tribune, only 14 kilometers away from Shibenik, we again find ourselves along the Adriatic coast. The small church of St. Nicholas is the trademark of this old island city with its narrow alleyways. Most visitors, however, come because of the secret trademark, the donkey. The islands of Logorun and Lukovnich lie about 100 meters off the coast of Tribune. After a life of service, donkeys from the region are sent to these islands and cared for during their well-deserved retirement. Only once a year, during the first week of August, are they pressed into service again on the mainland. Thousands of people stream into Tribune during that time for the week-long festival featuring several donkey races. The masses descend on the small town already in the afternoons, disrupting the normal peace and quiet of the locals. Things really get lively right after sunset. To the delight of the spectators, the donkeys race around a short track at a somewhat quicker pace than usual. If they could, the donkeys would probably think back with a bit of amusement on the days of their really strenuous work in the olive groves and on the fields in the dry heat of the day. The winning jockey rejoices in his trophy, and thanks to the income from the festival, the donkeys will be well taken care of for another year. In Drogir, in the Bay of Castel, things are less turbulent but still very lively, with good reason. The city, founded by the Greeks already in the third century before Christ, is an inhabited open-air museum. This small island city, with its population of only 10,000 people, is riddled with historic buildings from fortresses to cathedrals and works by famous sculptors and painters. At peak periods, thousands of tourists mill about on the Riva, the harbor promenade. They are brought in for day trips by land and by sea from the surrounding regions. One has to get up early to experience day-to-day -day life on what the Croatians would call a typical market day. The reward is well worth the effort. The rich variety of fresh fruits and vegetables grown in the backlands and on display here is amazing. Daily life for the citizens of Drogir also includes living in the midst of historical buildings and monuments. The town hall in the old city, for example, was built in the 15th century. Right next to it is a clock tower and a covered arcade. The arcade served as a court of law during the Middle Ages. Justice is the theme of this bas relief on the arcade wall made during the time of Venetian rule. An ancient judge's table also still exists. Constructing these buildings often took a long time in Drogir as well. The Cathedral of St. Laurentian took 400 years to build. The other churches and chapels went a bit quicker, but they are filled in the same way with valuable art treasures. The various building styles reflect the development of architectural trends and fashions over the centuries. The churches and chapels in Drogir serve not only as houses of prayer, they also house impressive collections of sacred artworks. As visitors wander through the old city, whether through the numerous narrow alleyways and courtyards or inside the buildings, they never have the feeling of having left a gigantic museum. The presentation of such great respect for artwork could conceivably be considered to go a bit overboard. 
The question could arise in the mind of a neutral observer whether Croatia, which only became an independent state in 1995, isn't perhaps focusing too much on the past. On the other hand, anyone having some of the very first musical score sheets in their possession must surely be allowed to take pride in their rich culture. And finally, there are cities like the university town of Split. Here, the merging of past and present has worked particularly well. At first glance, the city center seems the same as many other European inner cities. But then the Diocletian Palace draws the attention. The ancient building complex was the retirement home of the Roman Emperor Diocletian and today basically makes up the old city of Split. In the halls of the massive building, protected from the sun and the rain, active trading takes place. The arcades leading down to the harbor promenade serve as a fish market among other things. Already during Roman times, the complex served as a combination of palace and villas for members of the royal family. It is amazing that the fundamental concept for the use of the building has not really changed over the centuries. Today, the modern apartments and houses in the palace are coveted properties in the midst of aesthetically beautiful surroundings. One has less the feeling of walking through a palace and more of being in a small town. The more than 220,000 inhabitants of Split and the many tourists keep things lively inside the historical city walls. One of the favorite places culture-minded people like to meet is the Peristyle, a combination inner court and columned hall. Concerts are performed here regularly. Sometimes they are modern entertainment events and at other times classical or church music concerts. The intensively cultivated Christian faith of the Croatians is clearly felt in Split as well. It finds expression in the many churches and seems to stand in contrast to the industrial prowess of the city. After all, tourism is not the main source of its wealth, but rather shipbuilding, industrial chemical production, and metalworking. But nowhere in this culturally rich country on the Adriatic will you find any real conflict between religious expression and the modern world. In fact, in the recent past under communism, Croatians expressing their faith in God was a form of silent protest against that atheistic regime. Croatia became a completely independent state for the first time in its history only after the dramatic events which took place between 1991 and 1995 came to an end. The country has quickly found its own pathway into the future as a friendly host to visitors from all over the world and as a country in which the purposeful view into its colorful past strongly confirms the importance of a peaceful Europe in the future. <laughs>